All right, are we uh, all freshened up? Sounds good. So we're going to start ahead with the uh, database panel. Uh, my name is Raymond Chang. I'll be moderating the database panel. And we're going to start with, again, uh, some five-minute uh, lightning talks or just brief introduction into some of the projects. We're lucky to have uh, Carson from Textile, uh, Rick from uh, Vulcanized DB, Dimitri from Fluence, and Mark from uh, Gun. Uh, so let's see. Let's see who's first up here. You're up. Feel free to use this. Yes. Actually, can I use this mic? Hello, world. I'm Mark Nadell, and I'm the founder at ERA. We run the GUN protocol, and it's a decentralized database. That's why I'm on the panel today. And we have about 15 million monthly active users with over 10,000 developers in our GitHub community. We're about six years old. We're not a blockchain, so may, may have heard of us, may have not heard of us. There's no coin. So the reason why we've been able to hit this type of scale is specifically that we support mutable and immutable data. It turns out that if you're running a decentralized app like Google or a decentralized app like Uber, being able to mutate your index is very important. If you have a peer-to-peer -peer version of Uber and you're updating the GPS coordinates of the driver that the passenger wants to see, that can be updated hundreds of times per second on gun in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So that's very critical to giving the user experience that people expect. If it's immutable, it, it, it's very difficult to scale up. They have different use cases, though. So the way this works is using this fancy academic jargon word. It's commutative replicated data types. You might often hear about it as being conflict-free replicated data types. And it's a mathematical structure that you can kind of think of in language as me saying you and me saying me. So if I say you, Rick, right, then if you hear you, we all converge to knowing I'm talking about Rick. If I say me, we all know we're converging to Mark. And this is completely deterministic and does not require any coordination. So you don't need some sort of blockchain to get this sort of consensus. You don't want to use it for financial transactions, though. If you dumbly write a machine parser that takes you and it receives it, it will interpret you to mean Mark from that perspective. So that's just a language analogy of how the CRDTs work. There's a bunch of different types. Um, so last year, we did about 3,000 transactions per second um, in production on a site called notabug.io, which is a peer-to-peer -peer version of Reddit. And the total cost was less than $99. So today, I'm pretty sure we can do a lot more than this um, on a lot cheaper, but I just haven't uh, checked the stats on that uh, since last year. So these are the main uh, decentralized apps that are built on top of us. DTube, a decentralized version of YouTube. Hacker Noon just came on board a month ago as they moved off of medium.com. Part of their new platform is decentralized with Gun, and that's where most of our users have come from. And then Internet Archive is decentralizing their um, library on top of Gun, and then the peer-to-peer -peer Reddit. So the last thing I'll end with is, um, with respect to kind of the blockchain side of the equation, we're considering building a layer two blockchain, where layer one is actually our decentralized database, and we add a blockchain on top, not underneath. And we're probably going to try doing that by next year. This, oh, okay. this, one. this one, I guess. Um, hi, I'm Carson from Textile. Um, so I'm just uh, I'm one of the core devs in a community wrangler uh, for Textile. Uh, I come f to Textile via academia, um, and that comes with some baggage that we can always talk about over beers at some point. Um, but I'm going to use my five minutes just to talk a little bit about I think how Textile came to accidentally build a, a database, um, and I think that will kind of inform maybe my answers to questions later. So 
Firstly, Textile, the company, is kind of driven by this, uh, this mission or distrust, basically, in hoarding user data. And uh, our team all kind of got together and didn't like the future that we imagined would happen if uh, we kind of continued on this uh, Internet 2.0 that we, ha we have now. Um, so we've converged on this idea of basically trying to change the way people use their data with applications on the internet. Um, and a big piece of that is just uh, control of their data. Uh, so te tectile, Textile, the technology, is basically just a set of protocols and tools designed to make it easier for developers to work on top of IPFS, or the interplanetary file system for those who uh, somehow haven't already heard about it at this conference. Um, so we have a bunch of different components for identity and storage, and I'll talk a little bit about that storage piece um, here and you know, throughout the thing. But really, we didn't start off building a database, uh, and I suspect this is a common feature among people who end up building databases. Um, we basically had an application that we were developing, a uh, user-facing application called Textile Photos, and we ended up having to solve a bunch of problems in a sort of decentralized way and ended up building something that uh, looks a lot like a database. Um, and so on the database side of things, what we did end up building initially was basically like a, a very simple, highly opinionated, multi-writer CRDT-like uh, append-only log system, which uses IPFS uh, content addressing uh, to uh, link, for the most part, data um, that's pretty scalable, um, works well between a limited number of uh, uh, collaborating peers, so like on the orders of hundreds or thousands, not millions. Um, and uh, maybe some of you are familiar with it. This is basically what's running on my phone that's sitting in my backpack right now. Um, it's basically running a light IPFS node with a, um, this textile peer database running on top of that. And it works in mobile, works on desktop, blah, blah. It's great. Um, but that's basically Textile yesterday. Um, and we're changing things uh, up a little bit based sp sort of on how we end up using and how uh, other applications have started building on top of Textile. We do not have the numbers that Gunn or pretty much anybody here probably has in terms of um, production. But we do have quite a few apps and things that are building on top of Textile. And that's the kind of core thing there. So we've started moving to more of like an event sourcing uh, framework. Uh, based on some command query or CQRS uh, type functionality. I'm not gonna go into the details, I think, of this slide. Uh, you can just kind of uh, ask questions about it um, later, but uh, it, it includes features for access control, uh, key management, and user identity, and all of these things in, uh, built on top of libp2p and IPFS. Um, and it runs on mobile and um, uh, most devices already, uh, and in the next three to six months, we'll have a, a light, uh, pure TypeScript, JavaScript implementation as well, so that you can run a uh, full decentralized IPFS-based uh, database in the browser as well. Uh, so I'll pretty much leave it there at that. Um, oh, I look at that, I had some animations and various things. Uh, but the most important thing is uh, contact information, so, um, Love to answer any questions that you might have later on, and um, uh, really looking forward to getting the panel going. So, thanks. Hi there. Uh, I'm Dimitri from Fluence. I'm doing engineering, and, uh, uh, engineering at Fluence Labs. So, what is Fluence? Uh, Fluence, in general, is an open source decentralized cloud computing platform and it has databases as an essential, essential part of uh, the cloud. Uh, so in the cloud we want to have uh, cloud services to build end user applications from prepared components. Uh, and uh, that's what we currently have. What's uh, the most important on uh, decentralized databases panel probably is that uh, we have uh, SQLite and uh, we have fork of uh, Redis and we have another SQL database named the LamaDB uh, available in a single click. Uh, and it can also be embedded and used uh, as a part of, a, of an application. Uh, 
you can use uh, cryptography in Fluence uh, because usually a database, just user facing database is not enough. You want to have uh, uh, authentication or some other cryptography functions or for example, we have uh, verifiable ra random functions implementation and we have uh, lazy snark, which is a trustless of chain zero knowledge proof verification. Uh, and also we have Lambda function support uh, with access to database and uh, other services. So you can change the behavior of the program on the fly. Uh, how we achieve this? Uh, what is the architecture decisions? What are the architecture decisions that we've made? In general, the picture looks like this. Uh, we have a network of Fluence nodes uh, which consists of two layers. Uh, first is uh, a real-time processing layer or speed layer. And second, uh, we have delayed security layer, uh, delayed verification. Also, we depend on uh, decentralized storage. Uh, their swarm is depicted, but it could be another one. Currently, on the DevNet, we use IPFS. Uh, and we use Ethereum as a final source of trust. So how, how the components works. Uh, in the real time, we have uh, very small clusters combined together with a Tendermint, with a BFT consensus. And uh, by really small clusters, I mean that uh, it's enough to have four nodes or even a single node in the cluster to have some security guarantees. Uh, the registry of the databases or of the applications is stored in Ethereum. So Tendermint acts uh, as a proof of uh, authority uh, blockchain. And uh, every block is uploaded to a decentralized storage to provide data availability. And then uh, um, we have a delayed finality with a shared verifiers pool. So verifiers come um, they assign it, the job to verify the, a part of state transitions of the database. They download a, a transaction history segment from a decentralized storage and reply transactions one by one, reaching the next state. In case uh, of uh, any hash mismatch, if there, there is a divergence, um, a verification game is used to resolve it. So the main idea of verification game is that uh, we find out uh, the very instruction that produces different result uh, on different nodes, and uh, this instruction is small enough to be sent on Ethereum and be resolved on chain. So finally, we have uh, small clusters with uh, stateful applications, uh, which act very fast. Then we have a delayed finalization with shared verifiers pool. Uh, we use, we depend on, we rely on a decentralized storage to decouple one part from another. And we use Ethereum as a final judge and a source of trust. That's all about Fluence, thanks. Hi, I'm Rick. I don't have any slides. Um, so primarily what I do is uh, I'm a mechanism designer for hire. So I design mechanisms for my clients. Uh, in doing that, over the process of doing that, many of my clients um, had similar problems around extracting data from Ethereum and using that uh, effectively in a traditional data, uh, web, web two architecture, right? So uh, going through that process, we developed a system of uh, Vulcanized DB, which is a third-party verifiable indexing and caching service for Ethereum data. It's very, very particular, very focused. I mean, these are all much more general application sorts of solutions. Um, right now, Vulcanized DB is focused on, on one thing, which is allowing DAP developers to better serve historical data to their users. Um, 
We have one major client, uh, MakerDAO, so multi-collateral DAI. Uh, we work on providing an indexing and caching layer uh, for that service. So a very concrete example, you want to see all of the auctions that cleared you know, in the last month on Maker. Uh, if you were to do that naively using Ethereum, you would have to connect to a full client that you trusted. You would have to then ask that full client via the very grumpy pagination protocol for thousands and thousands of records, and it would take a, a very long time, depending on the age of the contract. Uh, what we do is we do all of that for it, for you in advance. The, the DAP developer specifies how to do that, and we do that in advance. Um, and then uh, when the user wants, to, wants that data, they connect to our, uh, essentially, our GraphQL fronted Postgres environment, and they get that data you know, in a fixed millisecond uh, time frame, uh, as opposed to the many seconds that it would take. Uh, if you've used uh, an Ethereum application and you start it up for the first time and you see that spinning wheel as it tries to figure out from which block to rebuild, we eliminate that spinning wheel completely. Um, and we do that right now today. Um, in addition to that, we are also building a th third party uh, verification, right? Because all of this data is derived from Ethereum data, you can generate Merkle proofs to prove it all. Um, and so we've done a lot of research on that, and it's not in the repo right now, but you can use Vulcanized DB to generate these proofs. So they're, they're fairly sizable. So for example, a short history or a simple query, a user probably wouldn't use it. But if you're tracking an enormous amount of data that you want to verify from a particular DAP, we could provide the proof for that as well. Um, and that actually uses IPLD uh, proof. So I think you know, IPFS is used by almost everyone on the panel. Um, so, so we, we do that as well. Um, yeah, I have some time left. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to talk about uh, during my five minutes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the important thing is, is that it really is a standalone um, solution uh, for individual sort of developers. In the future, we will um, add a, a service like a SaaS platform and it'll, you can pay with, with Ether or DAI or whatever, but um, Right now, it's just we're focusing on making it so that it's easy for DAP developers to take their smart contracts and derive what their indexes should be, and then you know simplify the process of generating and operating those indexes for them. All right, well, thank you. So uh, the drought is over. And uh, there are multiple crates of water outside. I know uh, a lot of people have been asking here for water. So I think we're just going to take a very quick tops three to five minutes uh, to give people a chance to get water in case they haven't had water. And nope, don't want anybody fainting in the next 90 minutes here. And then we'll get started. All right. So uh, now begins the panel portion of this, uh, of this section. Um, I think you know we'll try to keep this light. Uh, it's a little awkward having people on both sides. You can't see each other, but let's try to make eye contact. Feel free to respond and uh, interject as necessary. Um, and I also love audience questions. So if people want to like raise their hand, I'll give you a thumbs up to like recognize that I saw you, so you don't have to like keep holding it up. And then uh, when I point at you, then you know feel free to uh, ask a question. Um, so just to get things started, um, I think what's hard about this panel compared to the last panel is that uh, decentralized databases, like the use cases here and the intended customer or the intended user is very, very different. Um, and that represents very, very different workloads. So um, the overview was nice in terms of the what, but if we could just go a little bit into the why specifically, like what is the prototypical ideal user and what kind of workload does that put on the technical system itself. Um, if we could start yeah, maybe, with, maybe with Mark. So I think the most cliche example of database systems is probably Twitter um, compared to a lot of the stuff before it. So Twitter just winds up having a lot of really small messages that need to get updated quickly and flow through the system to the other end users. So I think kind of social media is a really great representation. My bias is that pretty much anything other than financial stuff 
uh, databases are super good for. But social media, I think, is a really salient use case to focus around. Um, well, well, we have uh, several different use cases in mind. Uh, one is more tactical. Uh, we have a lot of decentralized applications around, and usually they all are decentralized, but uh, contains a central point of failure. Uh, they use uh, uh, computations on traditional clouds to provide a good user interface for end users. And uh, uh, our first thing uh, that we want to do is to uh, move a centralized part of decentralized software to, to decentralized environment. Uh, but then um, I think uh, that uh, Fluence can provide a, a great environment for general developing audience uh, because uh, uh, developers even uh, have no need to interact with tokens and the end users also can see no tokens, no uh, strange uh, means of uh, incentivization and so on. And I think in a, a longer perspective, uh, it could be useful for general audience as well. Okay, so I'm hearing, well, social media, when I hear social media, I'm hearing you need blobs. There's gonna be some kind of like time recency to it. So recent data is more valuable than, than older data. You're not talking about archival stuff. Um, in this case, uh, for Fluence, you're talking about like general purpose um, computing. So I think you're trying to be a little bit more uh, uh, general purpose workload. Um, uh, maybe on this side as well? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we're actually very narrowly defining our use case. Um, it, it could be blockchains more broadly. We can easily interop with other blockchains, but right now we're focusing on Ethereum, and it's almost sort of the opposite of GUN. Um, we're making, we're providing indexes. So what we're doing is we're taking old historical data Obviously, we're taking it in in real time. It's being generated every 14 seconds, but the primary utility is in taking the archive data and providing an index to the user, like a very basic thing. Like, this is something that people were doing in the 60s, right? But you can't do that with the existing Ethereum tooling. The same thing with Bitcoin and a lot of other chains as well. Um, they just don't have the tooling for these basic in indexes. They, you know, they're, they're cypherpunk nerds and they don't, they don't care if you actually read the data later. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's why we made it was, I mean, literally we built an app, it's called ether signal. It was for the DAO, um, you know, to people to vote on it. And we just had the spinning wheel and the spinning wheel. And, and we looked in the documentation, we're like, so what's, what do people do? And they're like, well, you know, sometimes you decorate it red and blue. You know, there was no talk of eliminating the spinning wheel. It was just, it was just there. Um, and we're like, well, that's ridiculous. So we worked on a solution. So we're talking about relational data here. You said you're backed by Postgres. Uh, yeah, we use Postgres. But that's, I, I, I'm happy to have a whole alternate discussion about how awesome Postgres is, even as a key value store. But um, it turns out that Postgres is also awesome as a key value store. So um, yeah, it, we very much leverage the relational capabilities of Postgres. And we hope to augment those with uh, adding uh, uh, Wasm as a as a PL to Postgres to so the people who know what that means, um, we're really pr big proponents of it. But yeah, we use all of this relational information so that we can build better indexes, um, and that and that's sort of the important thing. Uh, and I'll uh, sorry to get like really uh, Ethereum nerdy here because I don't know how much everyone is into Ethereum nerdness, but. When you get the data emitted from Ethereum, you're not getting like a database record. Right, so in, in a normal database environment, people would be sending you record updates. In Ethereum, you're getting these events that you then have to sort of extract uh, what the record ought to be. So because it's this weird event model, um, uh, the relational part becomes very helpful because of gas costs. So like it, you can't afford to emit a proper record. So you emit, in fact, with Vulcanized DB, you don't need to rely on event logs at all. You can actually uh, use the inspection of the contract memory. And then we'll, from that, derive all of the tables that need to be, all of the records that need to be created from that one memory location being updated. Um, so yeah, it's, it's necessarily relational because the, the data is relational. 
Test. Yeah. So uh, with Textile, our sort of initial motivation was personal data, um, and we kind of tried to. F we started with like, what's the most personal data, um, you know, that uh, really drives that point home? And we started with photos, just because it's a sort of fundamentally pretty personal thing. You take pictures of your kids. You don't want to maybe put that on um, social media or something like that. So you want some sort of private store of that information. So that's where we started. Um, and effectively, that's event data, right? Like you're, you're doing something, you take a photo of it, that's an event, um, and the data gets treated as such, uh, sort of in the underlying database in, uh, in Textile. But uh, once we started sort of developing s sort of slightly more generic tools for other types of personal data, um, so for instance, any type uh, gave a lightning talk earlier, and that's personal data, that's data that you're deriving in order to represent you know, your thoughts and ideas and sort of aspirations and plans. Um, and that's a very sort of collaborative framework. So it's like small bits of JSON diffs or these types of uh, little bits of information. Um, so the, the underlying sort of uh, framework and infrastructure is designed to have flexible indexing on event-based data. Uh, and then the sort of framework that we're moving to is that uh, we just like ingest event-based data um, with some schema uh, to make it easier for consumers on the other end to actually derive uh, materialized views of that event stream. And that's like, this is a very common kind of framework um, for like um, event storm is an example of a not decentralized version of that. Um, and that's the sort of framework that we uh, work with. Yeah. To jump in and respond to Rick's comment, I, I also highly um, recommend Postgres. Uh, for if you're doing anything that's not decentralized. But I wanted to clarify that GUN is very good with indexes, and that's a large reason why we're able to scale up. Because if you look at the top five websites in the world, Google, YouTube, Facebook, Reddit, Wikipedia, they're pretty much all just indexes of the best content or the most recent content. And if you then look at... Um, where banks fall, at least with respect to blockchains, they're not even in the top 100 websites in the world. So if you're trying to target a workload and a decentralized system, you need to look at, well, what do most users actually use? It's trying to create a decentralized replacement of those top five, and you need a highly mutable decentralized uh, database that can do indexing. And that's a very hard problem to solve. Gun does it well, but then banking is completely different. Don't use Gun for banking, but banking does not hit even the top 100 most popular websites. Cool. Um, so uh, just, just to break it down a little bit, um, again, because these use cases are so different, maybe walk through a little bit of uh, what steps does a user need to take to actually use the system? Do I need, how big of a beefy machine am I, do I need? Am I running a node? Uh, or am I using someone else's node, stuff like that? I could start this time, I guess. Uh, well, it depends on whom you are referring to as the user. In, you know, in a lot of cases, when you develop a database, you're kind of hoping that you know, end users are never ever going to know anything about it. Uh, that's kind of the whole point. But so from that perspective, like textiles point of view is that the user shouldn't really have to do anything. Um, and that's a really hard problem to solve in the decentralized space, especially when you're trying to have things like encryption and sort of data privacy because keys are involved and you necessarily probably want users to be able to control that. Um, but our approach has basically just been users shouldn't have to know any of that stuff. It should just work with the zero config setup. They should be able to start using that. And then if they become a power user later on down the line, they can get their keys, they can do all the sort of things that they might want to do to actually modify and interact with the database directly. But if you're talking about the developer as a user, which is the sort of other side of our space and you know, probably what most of us consider our sort of day-to-day -day customers, then there's necessarily a little bit more involvement there. So from the textile point of view, um, I'll focus on mobile. That requires actually a fair bit of work um, because the developer needs to a, know how to write a mobile app. Uh, B, they need to be able to integrate 
our mobile SDK, whether that's Java or Objective-C or um, React Native. Uh, they need to have uh, developer keys in order to um, do some of the sort of developer side encryption stuff. Um, they need to decide if they want uh, remote backup, and if they want that, then they need to configure their uh, remote peers to automatically connect to the user's mobile peers. And so there's a lot of sort of tweaking. Um, and I think as like the developers of the database system, we want to make it as easy as possible to start using it and then easy to extend it further um, that way as well. So like the default should be pretty good, and I think we're getting pretty close to that. Um, but the you know very specific use cases necessarily require a lot of uh, a lot of setup, I would say. Yeah. Um, so for Vulcanized DB, you as a use end you our end users are developers, right? Like you were just saying, like there's no normal people involved. So um, as a as a user, you you download the code. You, you know, you optionally run the Docker image. You need to configure uh, uh, an Infura endpoint to really get started. We have some sample code where we will read. You can point. Um, we sort of automatically decode contracts and sort of give you the sort of the endpoint that you would expect from like an ERC-20, for example. So you have to specify the ERC-20. You have to uh, point it at Infura. Uh, you have to run it uh, in Docker, and you're ready to go. But that's like really just like not even dipping your toes into the into the ocean of, of features. Um, so if if you were to really use the system, uh, you need to be able to uh, basically write transformers, is what we call them. So we we extract data from Ethereum, we then load it into Postgres, and then and then we kind of do that automatically. And then um, there's a transformer that you write that ex expresses how you want that smart contract to be exposed via GraphQL. Because, uh, and we can automate, like I said, we do have some automation for that so for, some, for some sort of like trivial cases. But if you've written your own smart contract, you have to, at this point, specify how to do those transformations. In the future, we're going to automate that. But um, right now, uh, you've got to write it yourself. So speaking about Fluence, uh, we also have two parties. Uh, we have developers and we have end users. Um, for developers, uh, the main question is uh, uh, how to prepare the deterministic WebAssembly code. So we provide uh, components, uh, WebAssembly modules, and uh, uh, we provide uh, guidelines and uh, various uh, language support. But finally, a uh, developer should uh, take these components and glue them together in a deterministic way. So that's the most hard part. Uh, for the end user, uh, the main question is how to discover which particular nodes uh, handle a particular application. And uh, there we have two ways, an easy way and a paranoid way. An easy way is to uh, find uh, the nodes through Kademlia network influence. But in this case, uh, you need to trust this network uh, where we have no uh, special fluence blockchain. Another way is to discover the public keys of the nodes from the Ethereum. But in this case, you need to uh, query Ethereum uh, somehow. So that's uh, the most tricky part. But then it's just uh, looks like a web service, uh, pretty easy to use. For me, both application developers and end users, all you need is a browser. And that's because there's local storage and index DB that lets us store data in the browser. And then there is WebRTC and WebSocket. So if WebRTC fails, there's also a decentralized array of relay peers. They're just another peer in the network, but they happen to have an IP address. That could be a desktop that you have at home if you don't have a firewall running, or it could be a peer running in the cloud. And then the ease to which it takes to get set up, I'll just do some case studies here. Internet Archive had never heard of GUN about four weeks before 
um, last year's decentralized web summit. Three weeks in, they're like, okay, this is interesting. Two weeks in, they're uh, up to the conference. They're like, hey, can we try to decentralize it in an archive on top of Gun before the conference? And I'm like, yeah, like, no joke, like, you, you gotta be kidding. And then one week before, I met with the lead engineer, the decentralized uh, version of Internet Archive, and he integrated it in one week, right before the conference, and it was live. The same thing happened with Not A Bug, which is the peer-to-peer -peer version of Reddit. He built it in one week, <laughs> he built it in seven days, and on the first day of launch, they pushed about a half terabyte of traffic through the peer-to-peer -peer network. So a web browser and one week of time. And then ideally you get hooked and we hopefully get you to run a Node.js version of it and stuff like that. So amen very much to what Textile was saying that ease of adoption and, and users should not have to think or worry about anything. Just jump on and use it. Awesome. I actually have a question about that. Um, so in that week where they pushed a half terabyte, you said, of, of traffic, across whose infrastructure did that traffic run? Yes, so it took one week to build, and it was a half terabyte of traffic on the first day, not over a week. So they were running, and very quickly, he ran his first super peer, which is, I think, on OVH, but all the browsers were also storing the data. Um, WebRTC kind of fails 60% of the time, so he didn't wind up having that on, and so WebSocket was running through the relay through his OVH server or super peer. And very quickly, four other, um, four other people cloned <coughs> the site because uh, it's open source code and then set up multiple different domains like don't sue me bro.com and a couple, I, I, most of them are defunct now. And that traffic was being spread across roughly five IP facing super peers. And then uh, I think at that point, 60 users um, was the average uh, per second number of users that were on in that first day. So he was be able, basically able to spin that all up from his, OV, his single OVH node was able to handle all that traffic? That was a bootstrapping peer, but it was not the one that handled everything because the other ones then... Um, so the other peers on the net, so it was truly peer to peer, they were somehow synchronizing over WebSocket uh, because WebRTC went down, so they had some, you had some other protocol? Synchronizing over GUN, which can work with WebRTC, WebSockets, TCP, UDP. Oh, I see, I see, <laughs> okay. I think I get it, cool, yeah, thank you. Cool, any other questions uh, about before we deep dive into some of the technical meat? Yeah. I like, like your gun database. It is a real interesting thing, but uh, I can't uh, understand. Is it BFT? No. Uh, BFT is Byzantine Fault Tolerance and that's necessary for financial applications, which is why you, you should not use GUN for anything financial. But I think it is necessary in your case too, because uh, you said um, your GUN, DB, is intended for social application. And um, what do you think if I change your own post? Me, your post. Uh, that's not possible because we have a layer called C, which stands for Security Encryption Authorization, and it's cryptography. So all the data going through the system is signed and doesn't require any validators either. So you can't tamper with somebody else's data. You do not need BFT um, to, to make a tamper-resistant, uh, strongly secure system. So you're using encryption for authenticity, but what are the types of guarantees that you can get over, you know, like with BFT, you know, sometimes you're worried about ordering of events, sometimes you're worried about your consistency model. Like, what are the, what are the types of things that you, you know, uh, there actually is a question about this, about threat models, so why don't we just skip straight to that. Um, uh, you know, what threat models are you trying to attack, and, or, or sorry, trying to address in, in the design of your system, and, and which ones are you not, and out of scoping? I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, earlier this morning, if you saw Jacob's talk, most decentralized databases, and even centralized databases, fall under this theorem called CAP theorem that kind of um, that represents this. 
And we are, if you're familiar with the captain room, an AP system. It means we strive to be highly available and strongly eventually consistent, which is why you do not want to use it for banking because banking needs what is called strongly globally consistent. And that requires a, another academic term, which is serializability and linearizability. Gun does not have those properties, but for most social media applications, you don't need that. In fact, the benefit of Gun is that you can be offline and you can get a partition down the entire network and you can make different writes on both sides of the network and it will be highly available. You'll see those different writes. But then when the network comes back on together, the CRDT will synchronize and resolve the conflict once the connection is reestablished. So what, uh, maybe we can, if you don't mind, just expanding on the other side, which is to say, let's say there's a malicious, malicious superior um, that can write whatever code that they want to muck with your protocol uh, however they want. Um, what, are, what are the types of things that would be possible? Um, and are there you know, mitigations around some of those things? There is no difference between light client and strong client. There's just a difference between um, the availability of resources. So the most important malicious attack is that honestly web browsers, even with IndexedDB, most people are on their phones. So you just don't have much storage so the most likely attack vector is a super peer who says, yep, I got your data, I saved it, okay, cool, and then deletes it all. Um, now, that's why you should not use one super peer, you should connect to all the rest of them. So the attack vector is, yeah, if you're, if you're only using one super peer, then it's really a resource asymmetry. Yeah. It's not so much that there's any protocol difference or like client versus, there's no trust, you don't have to trust them. It's more just they have more So it's up to you resources. to make sure you have redundant paths and you have redundant replicas and things like that? Right now it's up to the application developer, not right. the user. And most application developers by default use multiple redundant paths. And we are launching a system called Axe, which automatically handles, even for the application developer, rotating between all the different decentralized peers. So that way even the application developers don't have to add two or three IP addresses. Cool. Yeah, I mean, we're in an almost identical framework to Gun in that sense. Um, I mean, if you think about sort of social sharing applications, photos is the example I, I'll always use, is uh, you're sharing with peers that you trust. Otherwise, why would you be sending them photos in the first place? So there's a sort of built-in trust that you can that we can rely on that we don't need you know a sort of global consensus to deal with. So that's like nice to have. Um, but we also deal only in eventual consistency. Um, if my photo of my cat shows up before my photo of my dog, it's probably fine. Um, and eventually it will get sorted in the right order. So um, you know there are some you know algorithmic guarantees in that sense. Um, and uh, then we start to, when um, developers who are building on top of textile decide that they need more concrete guarantees, um, you're able to sidecar, uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the uh, IPFS cluster project, um, but that essentially allows you to um, set up fairly, well, set up fault tolerant uh, clusters of IPFS peers um, with certain guarantees uh, about um, replication and um, availability and things like that. So you can sidecar IPFS cluster on, um, uh, we also have the concept of like a super peer, um, and again, it's just a normal peer that happens to be online all the time, versus what most of our peers are, which are on the phone, and I don't know how many people do mobile development, but basically the phone can just like shut your app off at any time, uh, and you don't really have much control over that. Uh, so. You just have to be prepared to be shut off all the time. Uh, but you can have always on peers that have a sidecar IPFS cluster to guarantee availability. And then your local peers would, you just, as, an as a developer, same situation as Gun, um, the developer is in charge of making sure that their mobile peers are always connecting to um, uh, the always on peers. And Textile provides some ones for developers to kind of play around with. But then ideally, you'd run, we'd, we'd have developers running their own as well. 
Yeah, I think uh, eventual consistency makes sense for, for social media apps. I mean, if Facebook can be eventually consistent, I think right. uh, yeah. it probably suits most applications. I'm curious, um, for Textile then, does that mean because you're built on top of IPFS, you inherit um, all of the, the same security considerations as, as IPFS? Are there additional ones that you, you have introduced that wouldn't be part of IPFS? Yeah, so uh, yeah, one of the reasons that we build on top of IPFS is because of the content addressing uh, component. So we get um, sort of content guarantees when you ask for a hash. Uh, assuming someone is hosting that hash, you're guaranteed to get the file that you're expecting back. So there's a bunch of nice uh, features that you kind of get for free uh, when you're building on top of IPFS. And more specifically, uh, we use libp2p for all of our um, uh, peer to peer transactions. So then we also get things like um, you know, uh, communication over UDP and TCP and soon quick um, and various other protocols that kind of just work uh, depending on your environment. Uh, but we've also introduced a bunch of additional layers of encryption. Um, and we've learned a lot over the last year and a half that um, we've had like public facing textile photos and textile developer tools um, in that space. So. We, we essentially have like three layers of encryption. Um, one that allows remote peers to just follow updates that uh, local peers are making, but, with no, but in a zero knowledge way. Um, so they can follow the like, hash tree, but they don't know what the actual content of those updates are. Um, and then we, it, it's linked up with the, uh, our sort of ACL access control list that you can provide. Um, when you're setting up the database as a developer. But um, uh, so we have that, and then every single file that's added to IPFS is one time encrypted, or is encrypted with a one time um, key. And then Textile handles the key management and the key distribution to peers that are actually allowed to access um, a particular th thread we call our database things threads. Um, but it turns out lots of other things are also called threads in the decentralized world, because that's a good name, so we might end up having to change that or something, but uh, there you go. What about you, Rick? Uh, yeah, so this is actually really funny. Um, because I'm a consultant on multiple other projects, I've kind of been biting my tongue. I've worked on multiple CRDT <laughs> projects, and I, and I would love to like chime in, but it's not really a part of Vulcanized DB. Um, <laughs> Vulcanized DB sort of at this moment right now, today, what you use is standalone. And it's for the developer to sort of deploy. So the end users are trusting the developer. Um, and you can stand it up, uh, you know, vert traditional Postgres vertical scaling style. Um, and, then, and, then you, and then the users get a proof from that service. So there's really almost literally no trust at all in the stood up service because the end user verifies that data that, that that data came from Ethereum themselves. Um, when we start talking about like how do we federate, quid pro quo, so there's a couple of different versions of Vulcanized DB that are in the works. Um, one of them is like a quid pro quo, which is very much, again, uh, P2P, uh, lib, lib P2P based even, um, just sharing blobs of data back and forth. Uh, it's IPFS data. Um, and then there's a third version where that's actually metered. So um, it, if the servers, you know, so now you can incentivize people to run their own, to run super nodes for services that they're not running themselves. Um, and in that case, we would be using, um, we would be using Tendermint for our Byzantine fault tolerance. Um, and we would be setting up small clusters, you know, of six and plus one nodes uh, to get agreement essentially all they're really doing is getting agreement on uh, IPFS CIDs and uh, the metadata associated with them, um, and um, and then distributing that. So uh, uh, just a like I said, uh, sort of preamble. Quick aside um, to your question about BFT stuff in the past. Uh, all of these systems, like very broadly from a very high level, we're talking about cryptographic agreement, and we're talking about well, how many people are coming to this agreement. And like, if I'm making a statement about myself, I'm the only person I need to agree with. So you don't need, this is to, to what he was saying before, so, so you don't really need uh, Byzantine fault tolerance then. And then there's other types of transactions, like a lightning network, for example, 
that is actually, well, let's uh, actually go that. So that's a one person agreement. And then you have like lightning is technically three people. It's Bitcoin and two people in private. And you can also have just pure private P2P agreements, which your, it sounds like your ACL system somewhat supports, where two people have found each other on a, on a network and now they just agree and share stuff back and forth. But, but if a third party were to come in, there's also, they would have no guarantees. They couldn't say anything about anything. Um, and then finally, at the end of this path, you have, well, first you have fault tolerance, which is like a traditional Cassandra database where you're making some assertions, but they're pretty flim flammy, frankly, and you have all this cap stuff. Um, and then finally, at the far end of that, you have Byzantine fault tolerance. And then even further, I, I like to use, uh, so that's 3N plus 1 fault tolerance. And then I like to talk about 6N plus 1 fault tolerance because basically what happens is if you imagine you have four nodes in your Byzantine network, which is the normal minimum number, um, you can have a split brain. But you don't have a Byzantine fault. And so when you're talking about real production environments, like I'm sure you see it with gun, a lot of split brain situations. And so you would really actually want to have like seven nodes so that you could guarantee that you never have a split brain. Um, and so that's one of the things that, again, from like my client research, it comes up all the time. And if you look at the literature, it says, oh, four is fine and a hundred is fine. And it's like, no, like 101 is actually way better than a hundred. Um, and so, yeah, sorry, this is a little aside. So well explained. That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for Fluence, actually, you know, you guys have a, a if I re recall correctly, you were saying that you could run compiled databases in WebAssembly on top of Tendermint, right? And so uh, the guarantees that you get with that which should be a lot stronger. Could you explain a little bit about the threat model that you were designing for and um, the security properties? Um, well, a lot of parties are involved in the computations. <laughs> In Fluence, uh, we have uh, the application developer who can be malicious because uh, uh, they want to pay less and to use more resources. Uh, we have uh, the Tendermint cluster, uh, which have uh, different motivations, like they want to change the results and to fake the results. They could have motivation to fake the results of certain computation, or uh, to uh, pretend that uh, uh, there should be more payment for the resources consumption that actually was uh, consumed. The same holds for uh, verifiers, uh, which are not motivate, motivated uh, by default to perform any verification job at all, and uh, uh, they want to pretend that they do something to get paid. So, um, in general, this means that uh, we have two fundamental threats. First one is uh, that uh, there will be a state transition that shouldn't happen. And another one is that uh, uh, there is a difference between uh, actually consumed resources and uh, uh, what uh, reported to be consumed. Uh, and uh, in general, we, um, we want to make it impossible to fake, fake the job, to fake the state transition. That's why we have uh, all these uh, chains of verification, verifiers and uh, verification game and so on. Uh, but in general, we think that anybody could be malicious and uh, there should be incentives to punish it or to force, uh, to uh, enforce it to behave. Makes sense. So it's a pretty, pretty different problem um, where I think you guys actually care a lot about the correctness of a particular state transition, whereas for some of these other projects, it seems like you have other mitigations to kind of route around if there's failures. Cool. Um, well, let me jump back a little bit. Because um, it's a storage system, <clears throat> Um, I, I'm curious uh, if you guys can talk a little bit about um, if, there's a, if there are any guarantees that you can provide, like how do you make sure that the data is going to be there, um, what kind of uh, durability SLAs could you provide, um, and how do you make sure that the data is still there when, when you need it? <clears throat> uh, yeah, sure. Hello. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so this is obviously, it's a big deal, and if we're working with uh, people's photos, you know, you don't want to be responsible for losing all of those uh, cat photos uh, and things like that. So um, we have a couple ways of dealing with that. Um, one is right now, Textile, the, com <coughs> the company provides always on peers that users can just register with as uh, zero knowledge backup. Um, peer. Uh, and that's great until we run out of money uh, to pay for those things uh, and then uh, we'll have to come up with some other solution. But uh, what we're working on right now with some of the um, pinning services that have kind of evolved in the IPFS community, so companies like Pinata and uh, R-Trade and, and a few others, is we're trying to um, essentially develop a very easy way for users to just within a textile app or framework pay for guaranteed storage. Um, and so this would mean that essentially these um, uh, pinning services are running a textile peer or a light, which we're, we'd like it so that they only have to run a very light version of the textile peer um, that sort of interfaces with their existing infrastructure. Uh, and then users could say like, look, I want, you know, I want to pay this much money per month um, for storage and then let me know when I run out of space or uh, drop, you know, start dropping photos that are a little bit older than X, um, you know, days old or something like that. The really um, kind of nice thing about the photos example is that people want access to their very recent photos uh, fairly quickly. And so we have an IPFS peer running on their mobile device, for example, and uh, that actually keeps a cache of images that they've accessed recently, even if, whether that image was originally stored locally or if it was pulled from a, uh, like a swarm peer. And their local um, node will just keep a cache of that. So you, we kind of get that for free using IPFS and libp2p. They've got a cache of their recently viewed photos. But you, I mean, you know, hands up, how many people looked at photos that they took a month ago? Okay, well, they, you know, it's very uncommon to actually go back and do that. This crowd. There's a few weirdos in here looking at old photos, but otherwise, it's not very common, right? Most people stop um, viewing them. So one of the things we're discussing with the pinning services is actually they could provide fairly cold storage um, at a lower cost uh, so that when users want to access those older photos, they can wait slightly longer um, but pay much less to do that. Okay, I guess I'm going next. Um, so again, um, the Ethereum data, uh, we rely on the Ethereum network to provide durability, um, especially with regards to the light clients, uh, the light client, um, the, the headers. I mean, that's really important. Um, and then, because that's how you independently verify the data. Um, and then, um, in terms of the indexes themselves, uh, right now, we are building like our, so I, I've start, we're doing a P2P network, but we're sort of doing it the budget and prior and like not advertising way. So we're building out our own super nodes, and then at, we'll use those as you know as demand comes up, people will use those nodes. But um, you know, so that'll provide you know some durability. But I ultimately. Um, I expect that uh, DAP developers will want to make their data available to their users, and so they will provide whatever durability they need to to satisfy that, that requirement, and we're going to provide them more tools to do that. Um, so interestingly, I mean, it's interesting that you're talking about IPFS cluster because um, it's hard to do ACLs or access control on, um, on IPFS. And so uh, for us, we did a lot of research on IPFS. And um, one of the issues that we ran into, which I think everyone runs into who uses IPFS, is you have like a two minute warm up if you just use the normal uh, uh, IPFS DHT, um, which again isn't a killer if you're, it's funny because for your use case, it's like immediate photos, I want to see them now. Um, if you rely on that DHT, well, you don't get to see them now, you get to see them two minutes from now. Um, and so I'm sure that you're, uh, doing some P2P mitigations to because that's the, that's the common solution is the, the P2P mitigation there. So for us, uh, when we were looking at IPFS clustering for dirt for durability, we just decided it would be easier for us to do it 
ourselves, basically, um, because we do have a much uh, more constrained use case. So yeah, we're just allowing the DAP developers to provide their own durability if, they, if what we provide isn't enough. So in terms of incentives then, you guys, uh, the incentive models are pretty different, right? Where I guess for, for each of them, you, for, for, I guess for both you and uh, Textile, if the DAP developers need more capacity, then you just expect them to deal with it themselves. But yeah, I should also mention, I guess, as another project that works on top of IPFS, right now, they, you know, I'm sure it'll be better. If we get better, but right now we try to avoid the DHT as much as possible. <coughs> yeah, I mean, so we will eventually provide a service, um, but you know, I, I don't like to talk about stuff. I don't like to talk about code that hasn't been written yet. Um, that's just one of my weird quirks. Um, so you know, so it's not written yet. So. It'll be perfect. It'll run perfectly the first time. In fact, you know, I I uh, have a very good consulting agreement with uh, the angel Michael, and so every time he commits to Git, it just runs perfectly. It's really nice. What about um, durability and, and incentives on um, uh, Fluence? Uh, in Fluence, uh, uh, we have uh, a two-fold approach for durability. First, we have uh, real-time clusters, and uh, each node uh, must hold uh, the actual data in order to provide the next block. Uh, but uh, that's not enough for real data availability because we have a little number of nodes. Uh, and that's why we delegate uh, data availability to the underlying decentralized storage, which could be any uh, of existing ones. Uh, so that's first. Uh, then about SLA. Uh, we cannot guarantee SLA on the protocol level, but uh, uh, actually every node in the network will uh, collect the track record of uh, uh, previous jobs. And uh, user, end user, um, application developer uh, can choose uh, different nodes according to their needs. And also there's no way to measure um, latency, for example, between uh, a concrete node and a, a remote machine uh, of the user. Uh, that's why, well, for example, node could respond to all the clients except some. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's no measures uh, of this uh, situation from the inside of the, of the system. That's why uh, end clients, uh, developers, if they notice it, they can just ban some nodes. Uh, generally speaking, they can ban the whole cluster, and in this case, uh, it will be re-elected re from the uh, machines of the network and uh, bootstrapped from the decentralized storage. For GUN, there is about three layers. The first one is replication. Replication, replication, replication. And that's why it's so important that um, I, that I'm so focused on user adoption. The more users are on the platform, the more replication there is. The second piece is very much like textile in the sense that it's the application developers. The application developers have a strong incentive to run more reliable peers that back up everything on behalf of the various users. And that specifically is going to use a tit-for-tat model that Bitcoin uses. I'm oh, sorry, a BitTorrent that BitTorrent used. Um, so BitTorrent scaled up to like 40% of the world's traffic using that incentive model. So if you are an application developer on GUN and you want to run a super peer, you don't want to be the only one. And you know that other GUN application developers that are also running super peers will help contribute to your durability and replication. And then the third layer is going to be at some point primarily for private data. It makes a lot of sense that public data, like Twitter, everybody's gonna want to cache or have a backup for just to do machine learning on for data classification. There's a natural incentive for public data. But if it's encrypted and if it's private, you don't really wanna necessarily store that data on behalf of people because you can't mine it. So I'm guessing that at the third layer, 
we're gonna have to introduce some sort of tokenized system where if you have private data, you're gonna be paying you know, some very cheap rates to have your private data backed up by some service guarantees. And we can easily hook into any of the decentralized storage blockchains for that. We do it on Ethereum or IPFS or SIA or storage. So hopefully that problem will be very well solved and scalable so that way I don't have to do it and we'll just dump the private data into those um, blockchains and use those coins. Well, I'm glad you brought up cost. Could you talk a little bit about like, <clears throat> um, you know, the, the closest alternative in architecture and like how much cheaper is it? So, you know, let's say I were gonna be running, instead of using Gun, I was just running as a DAP developer my own, you know, storage databases, uh, my own servers to do that. Um, in comparison, you know, what, I, whether in like offloaded bandwidth or whether in offloaded, you know, uh, real costs, like hard drives and things like that, like how much cheaper is it to use, to use GUN? Well, this was a really cool case study of Hacker Noon, which just um, moved over like a month ago. We had two million monthly active users before that, and they have 13 million monthly active users. So I was a little bit scared when they were gonna come online, and I got to see all the numbers in the network just go And we actually managed to do it off of zero cost. The largest, system, the largest deployment in the network, adding the largest deployment in the network, zero cost, but we certainly started hitting some bottleneck at that point. So, zero. Um, and then there was another piece to that question. So basically, the, 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 the participants or the, the people viewing Hacker Noon are contributing to the network and uh, they don't have a choice over it because they're running this JavaScript. And so that adds the capacity, which basically means it's free for the publisher. Is that how it works? Well, I haven't quite been able to convince the CEO to um, turn over everything to Gun yet. Mm. Um, he, the CEO is very interested in decentralization. That's a large portion of traffic. Um, and so I know that he, he's interested in doing that over time. And they actually um, just officially told me they want to expand that part and start, and start adding more features that are decentralized. But the test, uh, the, the test run that we did, um, they specifically asked to turn off all of the decentralized features. Hmm. So we were actually running Gun in, in pretty much a, a purely super peer setup, hmm. and we were paying zero dollars for the super peer. How did that work? Uh, basically, I'm only able to handle about 15 million users, and then the system starts crashing every. In peak capacity, it starts crashing like every 20 minutes and then restarting and getting the whole network back on. So Hacker Noon was running the super peer? No. You were running the super peer? Um, uh, it's just that my demo peer from like five years ago. Oh, I see. So, and that's a free peer. I don't pay anything for it. But I have hit my limits, so I'm going to be spending the next year working on increasing that capacity. I see. So they didn't want to try... Um, including the, the centralized portion of it, which would have capitalized on all the visitors yes. as well. Yes. Like how much would that have increased the capacity of that, that demo, like in rough percentages, um, if they had turned that on? I, like Rick, don't really want, I, I don't know. I don't have numbers on that yet. So I'd rather, I'll tell you in maybe six, uh, seven or eight months, but. Do you um, have like back of the envelope estimations of a, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure we can hit 100 million monthly active users within two years off of um, probably, probably, well, so here's the thing, when, when, when it's running off of the users, you, you're, not paying the, you're not paying anything. Um, so, sorry, what was the question again? Uh, Cost or? Yeah, it's like uh, if I need to run one super peer to support, I don't know, a million users or something like that, like how many more users would I be able to support off of the same super peer if I had the centralization turned on? Yeah, so I think we'll be able to hit about um, 10 million users per super peer. And again, it's not centralized because the peers are also connecting to multiple, they're connecting to each other, right. not all of them, <laughs> um, but they're connecting to some others as well as other super peers. So I'm pretty sure for global scalability, um, we'll be able to do about 10 million uh, users per super peer. And the, another cool antidote about this is Internet Archive did a, 
a conference last month out in the woods, and we built a peer-to-peer -peer telecom. And the exact same code that was running with Hacker Noon was also the exact same code running in a fully peer-to-peer -peer mesh network. So, and it works really, really well. So I'm pretty sure for, for intercontinental traffic where you want super peers, about 10 million per free super peer. Um, and then if you're doing mesh networking, basically whatever population density you have in, in a mile radius, it would be, be totally fine. You're not gonna get more than 10 million people in a mile radius. So you think, um, hypothetically speaking, if I had a, if I ran Wikipedia, would I need, would I need to run multiple super peers? Um, yeah, or would well, it be the case that like, the decentralized network would be able to support all the capacity of itself. <clears throat> um, have somebody answer, and I'll do a quick mental calculation. All right. What about uh, uh, Fluence? Like, uh, are, do you guys have uh, a live network right now? How much does it cost to you know run a, a sample application, and, and what are, what are the costs currently in the system? Uh, currently, we are in uh, the DevNet stage, uh, so not all the moving parts are ready. <coughs> Uh, and uh, speaking about the cost, uh, the cost is uh, produced uh, with uh, execution, with the uh, usage of the resources. So if you use a CPU, uh, that produces uh, the cost of electricity for some involved party. The same calls for usage of memory, uh, memory access, and bandwidth. And uh, uh, we were estimating uh, number of uh, repetitions of execution uh, of the code in the managed databases in AWS uh, and number of the backups to provide uh, durability uh, in uh, AWS. And we figured out that uh, the exact number is uh, almost the same as Influence. But Influence, uh, you may use uh, commodity hardware uh, which uh, should reduce the cost. So for the common setup, uh, we expect the cost to be uh, the same or cheaper than on uh, AWS. All right, um, I did the calculation. So with the numbers that we currently have right now, extrapolating out to Wikipedia's size, it'd be about 1,000. However, I do think I can I, I do think with the optimization, there's several optimizations I know I can already do. I, so I think that I can get it down to 100. Um, so anywhere from 100 to 1,000, but if you wanna just go with the numbers that we know today in production, it would be 1,000. Um, super peers, peers to handle Wikipedia's uh, total traffic because then you have all the rest of the peers on Wikipedia that are helping, but about 1,000 to help with the global coordination um, of, of traffic routing between different data centers and continents. Cool. Uh, how do you guys think about uh, uh, pricing um, access and, and storage and, and the access to the database? Both, I guess, queries as well as like the actual data itself, right? Uh, yeah, we probably don't have a great estimate of the cost because it's hard to measure, I guess, basically. So we have the local peers running on a mobile device, so to the developer, a lot of that sort of like replication and uh, updates is for free. Um, and since we're dealing with sort of not sort of high throughput updates, that's usually pretty easy to handle. Um, so Textile runs a few uh, always on remote peers, and those are just like micro uh, AWS instances. Uh, for a long time, one of them was just like a free one that I had uh, running. So, you know, that's pretty low cost. I, I don't know what the sort of going rate is for a micro instance right now, but it's, it's pretty low. Um, and that's plenty of storage bandwidth and everything that you need to kind of just back up the, or to keep the network going so that there's at least always a few peers online. So as a developer, the cost is, you know, a few micro instances to keep backups going. And then your peers, be they desktop peers or, or mobile peers or whatever, are handling a lot of the uh, replication and queries and things like that. Um, 
and we support queries um, between peers through a sort of gossip-based protocol. So um, again, you don't actually need a full, you know, uh, a large node to be able to handle most of the queries that we support um, in like textile photos, for example. So the costs for the developer are fairly low there as well. Um, but if you want sort of snappier, faster, so we kind of for fun, I guess, run a couple of like super peers um, uh, through a startup grant that we got to just kind of make the whole network quite a bit snappier. And if you had to do that, that would be, you know, as expensive as a super peer in a cloud instance can get. Um, so uh, we have sort of an interesting problem in that we are providing, um, again, indexing over Ethereum data. So uh, we have to, um, as a service to our, our existing clients, we have to provide the Ethereum data very quickly. Um, and we have spent a lot of time and money, uh, well, not a, well, it's all relative. It took a long time uh, uh, universally, whether it was a lot of money or not is debatable, but we, we spent a lot of time uh, running a geth full archive node. So for those of us who have tried to do this on Ethereum, um, there back <laughs> when we started doing this in 2018, there was a lot of back and forth. It's been over a year actually, so I guess 2017. There was a lot of back and forth on Twitter, a lot of trolling and AFRI and or I think it might have been AFRI and like other people saying like, oh yeah, it's super easy. And it's like, no, it's actually it's not. It's not super easy. You need to be running SSDs. You need to be running them. Uh, we were running them in a, in a ZFS configuration. Um, and, um, and we do that so that we have immediate access to the Ethereum data. So it, for us, the end user who can connect to, to my node that I give them for free, it costs them practically nothing. Um, but for me to generate that data, it took a, a long time. It took uh, basically six months of trial and error because we were all doing other things and the node is stalled and you've got to rebuild from scratch and you've got to try to write some code to try to rebuild the database in level DB and go, and then you realize that doesn't work, and then you, so it, so it, took, a, <laughs> it took a long time on that side. And then, um, and then eventually when we go to the metered service, we'll basically be doing a metering very similar to how Ethereum and other blockchains do metering. Because we will be able to uh, go through this sort of compilation pipeline, we will know exactly how much each record costs to uh, generate, we'll know exactly how much each ret record costs to retrieve, and we'll know, so we'll be able to basically say, uh, and sorry, I don't know what everyone's database familiarity here, record is a row in a table, okay, just so we're clear, all right. So, uh, so we can, uh, unlike in a normal database use case, or maybe even in a, in a photography use case, you don't know necessarily how big someone's photo is going to be, uh, people are telling us in advance exactly how big each record is going to be. So we can uh, use that, um, to figure out uh, exactly what to charge the end user to serve them the record. So, so when the developer designs the query pattern that they're going to use, we can then price it at that time and then allow third parties to decide if they want to serve that data at that price. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how these markets will work, but again, uh, don't have any code for it. So, um, so I, I think that it'll end up being, uh, uh, again, very sorry for being so Ethereum-centric when everything else on the panel really isn't. Um, but I also work on the, uh, I work uh, very closely on the, on the state rent uh, issue. So uh, as um, the Ethereum nodes stop uh, providing the data to end users, we'll be able to sort of step in and have a pricing scheme that allows people to uh, store their data with third parties and have a very clear sense of how much that's gonna cost uh, in advance. Cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I wanna thank uh, all the panelists for coming by today and uh, thank you guys all for a great panel. <laughs>